Hey guys, it's Sandro here from Carcraft Auto Detailing in Melbourne. Today's video is part one of quite an in-depth series that will look at the process I go through step by step when approaching and completing a comprehensive three-stage paint correction and full coating protection detail. As I mentioned in my CarPro products review video, this detail, as with my interior detailing video, will almost exclusively use the CarPro product range to better help illustrate the results they can achieve. As I'm sure you're aware, there is quite a few videos out there that showcase some fantastic detailers work, but very few that actually demonstrate how they got there in practical terms, what they specifically used in relation to products and techniques, and why they chose to use and do what they did. My hope is that this series can answer many of those questions as well as illustrate them to the viewer in a very transparent and open way that helps explain not only what I'm doing, but also my thought process behind it. Having said that, it's important for me to express that most of the time there is no single definitive answer to just about any question relating to detailing. But I think that's also what makes it so interesting and keeps me wanting to know more. So questions like, what's the best polish, the best wax, and the best techniques for applying them can only be answered with more questions like what are you specifically trying to achieve? What sort of paint are you working with? And what's your environmental and conditions like? The best I can do is try to explain that my choice of products, techniques, and methods are what are best suited for this particular vehicle on that particular day in my particular environment. But I'll also add that another reason I wanted to restrict myself to only using CarPro products, which I don't normally do, is to demonstrate that just about any decent product can be tweaked and adjusted through technique and method to produce great results. I'll also add that this level of detail, unfortunately, is not the norm in my world of detailing, as understandably, it's not something that my average customer can afford or at least wants to spend on their car. But given the chance, and for my own personal cars, this is how and why I choose to adopt my personal philosophy that is primarily based on the longevity of the vehicle. And although it's something that I do push with most of my customers, ultimately it's their choice whether they want a detail or paint correction that is going to preserve the life of their vehicle, or if they're just after results without that concern. I've talked about pain correction in previous videos, how cars today have so little paint in comparison to the cars I owned and detailed many years ago. What this means is that unless you're correcting paint on a quality custom paint job with many thick coats, you're very limited in how many times and how far you can correct that paint, which can be difficult for me to explain to a client who just wants all the scratches on his or her paint gone that if I can actually remove them, it's really going to be a one-time thing. So if, or more likely in the future when scratches appear, there just won't be enough paint to do anything about them. And worse still, the potential life of that paint is being largely reduced. I know I may be doing myself a disservice by saying that, as I am in the business of restoring car paint, but the truth is, that you can get your paint looking 90 to 95% perfect without really compromising its longevity. It's only when you go after that last 5% or so, or you're trying to completely remove deeper scratches, that you're really removing a significant amount of clear coat and thus shortening the amount and life of that paint. Although this detail will be a three stage compounding and polishing job, I'm not going to be aggressively chasing every last scratch or defect. The three stages are primarily about restoring the overall finish and refining it to extract as much gloss and depth in the paint as possible without flattening texture or removing too much clear coat. And I guarantee you that this sort of level of correction is not going to significantly reduce the amount or life of that paint and is something that can be done many, many times over in the future, if needed, without the concern of burning through the paint. The additional durable layers of protection that I'll be adding 
will not only create a noticeable depth and increased gloss to the paint, but will also greatly extend the life of it and create a significant barrier to take the punishment of the daily environmental harm that would otherwise be directly compromising the paint. I hope that gives you an understanding of what my ultimate goals are with this detail and my thoughts behind why I'm taking this path and I'll do my best to try and explain further as we go through each step. So let me just catch up to the footage you've seen so far. The first point of contact with a vehicle for me is usually the walk around. Unfortunately, sometimes it's the only information I have to go by before giving a rough quote. So it's important to me to try and gain a quick feel for the car's overall condition, identify any obvious defects or potential trouble areas, and ask the client or owner to point out any existing areas that are of concern or need to be addressed. The truth is that we get to know our own cars fairly well. So when something new like a decent scratch appears, it stands out. But when you're trying to assess someone else's car for the first time, it can be hard to identify even some obvious defects when you have limited time, poor lighting, and a dirty vehicle that are all masking and obstructing your ability to make a true assessment. But even for my own cars, I always do a walk around before any sort of detailing, including just a wash, as it helps me identify any problems that I need to address before making any physical contact with the car. Next is the pre-detail inspection. Lighting is really the key for getting a true look and feel for the paint's condition. There are quite a few great detailing spotting lights out there to choose from. I love my Helenova 20s for the fact that they are both cordless and corded, have two brightness settings that you can choose between for your lighter and darker paints, and they're really reasonably priced and extremely rugged and durable. Ultimately, there is nothing more telling than using these lamps in total darkness as the only viewing light source. But as that's not always possible, they still will be quite effective out in the open. The key is to find the right distance between the light and the paint. Too close and you'll just flood the area with light, and too far will result in a weak, ineffective light source. For lighter paint types, you generally need the lower setting of brightness and more distance to gain the most telling light source. Whereas with dark paints, you can generally get your light closer and increase its output. So what I'm really trying to see and address is the overall condition of the exterior, including the paint, plastic trims, rims and glass. And what I'm looking for is defects such as scratches in relation to swirls, scuffs, chips and deeper isolated ones, as well as oxidation and fading, water and bird poo edgings, and previous touch-up, resprayed areas or repairs. I'll also add that no matter how thorough I am during this process, I'll rarely spot every single defect in this step or gain a true reading of the paint's condition until I've gone through the full paint decontamination stage of wash, iron removal and claying and start to compound each specific panel. One reason why is that dirt, grime, wax or sealants are going to mask the bare paint and all its defects to at least a certain level. And the other reason is that I'm human. But although it may not be perfect, it's still a very important and vital step for me. Photos and the vehicle inspection report are important pieces of documentation. Besides building a portfolio of your work, they can also be a lifesaver in certain instances to prove that certain disputable damage was there to begin with. The thing is, when a vehicle is littered with scratches and defects, any more prominent imperfections just get lost in its overall poor condition. But once you correct the paint, removing the vast majority of those defects, any larger imperfections that were there originally now stand out far more due to the near perfect condition of the paint. And I've had this happen a couple of times where a customer has asked me if a certain deeper scratch was there before I detailed it. I know they just didn't notice it previously for the reasons I've just stated, but it really is comforting and nice to point it out to them in their copy of my report that it was there to begin with. 
So at first glance, the overall condition of this Alpha seemed pretty good, and the walk around didn't really have anything too obvious jumping out at me. But with my inspection light in hand, as you can hopefully see, it's a very different assessment. The paint is uniformly covered with varying swirl marks, most likely from improper washing techniques. There is a good dozen or so minor touch-up paint areas that mostly seem to be rock chips. The lower skirt on the passenger side isn't sitting flush with the body, and the front bumper has definitely been repainted as it's a darker shade of red than the rest of the car and there's a lot more metallics in the paint. There is also some isolated deeper scratches, buffer trails, some serious water etchings along the roof plastic water channels and some baked on polish or wax residue scattered about. So apart from recording this information as a safeguard for future reference, how is it going to alter the way I detail or estimate the amount of time and work that will be needed for this job? Basically, I know that a single stage polish will generally remove about 70-80% to 80 of these particular swirls. But a primary compounding cut is going to be needed to get closer to that 90% mark of defect removal. And on a beautiful dark red metallic paint such as this, I also know that a final dueling polish is really going to make this red pop. Generally any touch up paint or repaired areas tend to be less durable than factory paint. So we need to be aware of this and address those areas a little differently as well as take extra care around the side skirt and front bumper and find a way to address those watermarks on the roof plastics. So I hope this explains the hows, whats and whys of my pre-inspection and gives you guys something to think about before jumping straight into a detail. So let me once again catch up to the footage. The engine bay is always my starting point on an exterior detail, basically because if you clean it after you've washed the car, you'll be backtracking to clean the mess that it creates. On inspection, this engine bay is in pretty good condition and really shouldn't need too much work to bring it back to a like new appearance. The worst affected areas are the plastic cowling around the windscreen and the front bonnet jam area that do have a decent amount of dirt and grime buildup. Apart from that, the areas that get touched more often, like the oil filler cap and the dipstick, are also somewhat covered in oil and grease. I tend to use a headlamp torch to light up the engine bay which really helps to allow me to effectively see the progress I'm making in what's usually a dark closed and shadowed area. Just as I explained in my interior detailing video of this vehicle, my first step when dealing with areas that have a lot of loose dirt and particles is to remove as much of them as possible in a dry state. Water and liquids mixed with dirt equal mud which is an abrasive that will scratch and damage surfaces. So the more dirt I can remove before introducing liquids, the safer the cleaning will be. Compressed air in the form of an air gun is really the best and my starting point. Basically, like most areas of detailing, just start at the top and work your way down, blasting the dirt out of the bay. Before introducing any sort of liquids to an engine, it's important to mask any sensitive areas such as exposed electrical connectors, batteries, distributors and alternators. However, this engine and most engines less than 10 years old have pretty much everything covered up and protected as far as what I'd normally mask in plastic. A steamer will always be my next step when working on a detailing job of this level. The great thing about steam and my Pulte Echo Pro steamer is that it has a beefy 5 bar of pressure combined with a temperature well over 100 degrees celsius and almost an hour of continuous steam that equals not only a very effective tool for cleaning things such as engine bays but also provides an extremely safe and chemical free cleaning action without having to physically touch any surface for most engine bays of this condition it really is enough to do the job but as I intend to apply a coating over some of the engine bay's components and trims, I really need to strip any more stubborn grease and grime that is still present after the steaming process. 
My next stage of cleaning and a tool I use far more often for engine bays in worse condition than this one is my Tornador air tool. For engine bays, I tend to use Meguiar's Super Degreaser at a 1 to 4 dilution running through my Tornador. As I don't want the degreaser to dry on the surface and I also want to give myself a longer working time, I'll firstly wet down the engine bay with water. Then working a section at a time, I'll use the Tornador's increased bar of pressure over the steamer together with the Super Degreaser to once again treat the whole engine bay without making any physical contact with the surfaces and thus performing an extremely safe and scratch free clean. I'll honestly say that I was a little surprised that a few areas of more stubborn grime were still refusing to budge after both the steaming and tornador stage. But this is a great example of something that happens quite frequently. I'll take a look at it and guess that it should be quite easy to do, but it turns out to be a lot more work than I anticipated. But having said that, if I wasn't coating this engine bay or going for close to perfection, the level of cleaning that the steamer and tornador achieved was well within a more than acceptable range. So the next step in my least aggressive method first philosophy is to work the engine bay over with my Swiss Vax exterior detailing brush and Meguiar's Super Degreaser. Again working a section at a time but focusing in on those last few stubborn bits of grime. The thing is that after the previous stages of cleaning there is next to no dirt or particles left on the surface of this engine bay. So really nothing to get caught and dragged along with the brush causing scratches. Whereas if I'd started with this as my first cleaning process I would have most certainly been picking up and dragging all sorts of dirts and particles and causing all sorts of scratches. The third cleaning stage has pretty much gotten the engine bay to where I want it to be prior to coating. I just give the engine bay a decent rinse down with a hose to wash away the degreaser's residue and then use my compressed air gun to blow out the majority of the water. A final wipe down with a microfiber cloth is done to mop up the remaining water to avoid any potential water spots and to stop airborne particles bonding to the liquid. The engine should then be started and run up to operating temperature which will evaporate any remaining water. Well that wraps up part 1 of this series. Stay tuned for part 2 which will cover the 3 stage decontamination process in preparation for the paint correction. I really hope this video and the following episodes will help some of you guys out there. Please like, comment and subscribe to show your support. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.